you are alive. Dawn has broken in the northeastern corner of South Africa, and you were watching the sun slowly making its way up the eastern horizon in the greater Kruger National Park, live. The birds are calling. Gently, you can hear a grey-headed sparrow. Chip, chip, chip. A crested Franklin. And some guinea fowl. And it is a perfect, perfect late summer's African morning. You just see the last star of the morning. My name is James Hendry, and you are on a live safari, as I said. Good morning to you, and you are most welcome. It's great to have you with us. Please do talk to us during the course of our three-hour sojourn in the wilderness today. Hashtag safari live if you're tweeting like the little grey-headed sparrow behind us. Or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to talk to us on the email. Also, you can talk to us on YouTube on the YouTube chat stream. On camera today, all six foot four of the thumb. Well, the thumb, of course, isn't six foot four. The thumb is attached to six feet four of Brian Joubert. Well done, Brian. Very nice design this morning. Thank you. And on the other vehicle is Scott Dyson, and he is being filmed by the diminutive but highly skilled Vion Durenbrach in the final control, Kirsten directing. And on the keys, I think it is Louise. I think that's the case. Now, we have had some wonderful updates during the course of the night. We had leopards calling, and that was Zumi, cat, Kevin, Catfish, and Adam. You told us that a male leopard came to drink at the pan, and then later we had an update from Star that the lions were calling, and now we heard them calling, and Scott is basically directly behind us calling there, uh, listening out for the lions. I'm just going to call him on the radio. Apparently, he wishes to speak with me. Go ahead, Scott. I will let you hear what he says. Uh, James, tracks of one male heading east along Balanites uh, at the four ways. OK, copy, thanks, Scotty. We will head down Twin Dams and then back that way. Copy, perfect. Uh, I'm going to just check carefully the four ways, but I... Uh, Okay, so that is the general idea of things. We'll try and find these lions first. I think they were calling. I think we've got a pretty good chance of finding them, so that's pretty good. Uh, we'll also check around for the male leopard tracks, but let's try and find those lions first. Over to Scott, and he'll give you an update of what he's going to do. Hello, everyone, and what a beautiful morning it is here. And what makes it that much more beautiful is that we've called you across to show you some big male lion tracks. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Scott. I'm teamed up with VM on camera. Take a look at these tracks. They are huge, huge feet. And they're so big that I think I actually need to jump out quickly and give you a size comparison, but we don't want to waste time. We actually heard this lion calling a little bit earlier um, from camp. So we know that he's pretty close by. Now, there's my hand um, next to that track. And that'll give you a bit of an idea as to how big it is. It is huge. That, interestingly, is a back foot, which is actually smaller than this track here, which is a front foot. This is considerably larger. Anyway, let's go and try and find you this big male. I'm so surprised that his tracks are actually here because we haven't had males on our property for so long. And they've been camping out south and east of us. And this track is coming from uh, the west, quite close to our boundary with Arethusa. So, exciting stuff and a huge surprise. Now, as soon as we found those tracks, we stopped to show you them. So now I need to check carefully as to where he's gone from here. It looks like I can see some of his tracks coming 
Yeah, he's come down this road in front of us here. He's heading straight down Rebecca's now. He's going to have stopped in this big open clearing that we're about to arrive at to watch the sunrise. Ooh. Just need to make sure that it's not two animals. I'm hoping it could be two of them. But we're doing some fast tracking here. Uh, James uh, tracks head east down Rebecca's from the four ways. I can go with that one. So I'm just keeping James updated as to every move that this line makes. Oh no. Just spotted a wildebeest ahead of us. Let me just check with you. Oh, we're in luck. Live, you on. And just one male line. Check out Rebecca's. What's that, everyone? That's who we're looking for. And he is in the big open clearing watching the sunrise. And there's a wildebeest in front of us. That's why I said, oh no, initially. Because. I wasn't expecting the lion to be nearby, but this is a great example as to, you cannot assume as you drive around now the wildebeest just started alarming. Let's take a look at this. But you cannot assume just because you look at an animal that appears relaxed, which at first glance he did, and even now, he's only let off a very soft snort. There he goes. So if he doesn't do one more. No, anyway, I'm sure a lot of you would prefer to go and look at the lion, so let's go and see who it is. Uh, Johan is one male lion just a, a little bit east of the four ways. He's lying up. He's quite full bellied. He does not look comfortable. He is very full. Hello, Marlena. And this is your second safari. And it sounds like you are hooked, which we are very, very happy to hear about. And wonderful to hear that you like to sketch uh, the animals, or I guess the scenes, whilst watching. And what a great way to keep busy while on safari. And I wonder what he's heard. I wonder what's got him up and listening. Looks like he's having a bit of a sneeze. And this, to me, looks like it could possibly be Scrapper. It does look a bit like him. So a different male to yesterday, hey, VM? Yep. Oh, look at that scar below his eye. They have been in some battles, these boys. Now, we hadn't seen a big male since the 24th of December until yesterday. And even that male seemed not in the best condition. Look at the massive gash below this guy's eye. And there's a coalition of five male lions, and it looks like he's one of them. I'm not sure. I'm having doubts as to whether or not this is an individual that's been called Scrapper by some, Tokolosh by the other, by others. But his eyes, his eyes don't appear wild enough <laughs> for it to be him. Sure, look at all the scratches and scars. It's not easy being a male lion. But at least this individual is very well fed. Who could you be? Well, if we're very, very lucky, we may get to hear him vocalize again. They will usually be most vocal when it's dark, but in the kind of first hour of sunlight and the last hour of sunlight every day, you can sometimes get lucky, even sometimes 
early on or late on into the morning or early on into the evening, but as a general rule, they will be most vocal at dusk, dawn, and in the darkness between. And it was his calls that helped us bring him into the, uh, bring us into this area this morning. We were sitting at the DRC, our camp, and Nikki, Viem, and myself all heard the lion's lion calling. Together, we all stopped, cupped our hands around our behind our ears to try and increase the size of our satellite dishes, and we were all in the general consensus that the call came from this general area. So it was three sets of ears that helped pinpoint where he was, and then his footprints helped us with the rest. I think he can maybe hear the lions calling now. I oh, know he said the wildebeest. The wildebeest has come for a closer inspection. You can see it up there in the top right. Now, it's possible that the wildebeest has not seen the lion yet, but he simply smelt it. That's a high possibility. Imagine we saw this lion catch the wildebeest. Anything is possible, but because the lion is so full-bellied, he's not gonna be as motivated to pursue the wildebeest as if he was hungry. Ah, Eddie Abbey, you've mentioned that if this big male lion is full, there could be a carcass nearby. Yes, that is certainly possible, but in this morning's scenario, I think he has finished off whatever he's fed on. and moved into this area before we found him sleeping. I don't think he would have strayed far away from the kill and even just the, the distance that we've been following his tracks would indicate that he's just a little bit too far away or would have moved too far for a kill to still be here. So I think he's finished whatever he did feed on. That would be wonderful to know. Did he make a kill last night? Did he steal something from a leopard? What exactly? Did he catch and feed on? He may not necessarily have caught anything last night. He may have been full-bellied from yesterday morning. And still retaining signs of that full belly. That's certainly a possibility. Hello, Lucy in Indiana. You'd like to know if this lion has got a lady friend nearby. And it doesn't appear that at the moment anyone is around other than the wildebeest that is snorting and an impala that's also keeping an eye on the situation. So he was doing a solo adventure, it appears, last night. His tracks also indicate the same thing. It was only one set of tracks. At one moment, I thought there could have been two sets of tracks moving down the road, but that was a false alarm. Ooh. Now, I'm hearing Impala's alarm calling. And Something's making me think that there's another predator here. Let's take a, a, a quick drive around. I don't think this lion's gonna go anywhere. So a pile of alarming just up ahead of us here. Um, let me take another route so I don't want to disturb the lion. But where these impala are alarm calling, it just doesn't add up that they could be alarming at the lion. So, who knows, maybe there's a big male leopard that some of you saw at the Juma waterhole, or heard rather. Maybe he's moving through this bush up ahead. Hard to be certain what's going on. Don't go anywhere, lion. We are coming back for you. Escorting us. 
to hopefully the next predator. Just going to stop here. The impala is somewhere ahead of us. Oh, no, there's something else going on here, guys. There's definitely something else going on here. Come on. Ooh. Okay, I can see the impala. I can see the impala. That's good. When we see the impala, then we see where the impala is looking. Then we find the other predator. Hold on tight. This is going to be a little bit bumpy. Karuna, is it you? Uh, no. Oh, the Impala sadly disappeared. It's still alarming. Now, what's interesting is that recently it appears like some of the Impala, the males, have been making rutting audio. And actually getting caught up with one another. In terms of the excitement they've been egging one another along. So I don't know if it's that. I don't know if it's a bit of hormonal vocalizations as opposed to alarm calling, but it just doesn't add up for them to still be acting like this. They would have, they shouldn't be running as they have. They should rather be looking where they last saw the predator. That would be more typical behavior of an impala that's not being hormonal, but rather being wise about possible alarm calls. Vim, are you also picking up what I'm putting down? Doesn't, yeah. they don't seem to be focused enough on a possible threat. They're like making the alarm call, but... They're making the right sound. Yeah, they make, they're certainly making the right sound, but I think it's... I think it's just a hormonal thing. Possibly they've smelt the lion. You know, so they know there's a bit of a risk, but then... just got caught up in their own little affair there and having like an argument about where the lion's gone possibly as opposed to there's the lion we're alarm calling we know what's going on oh who knows maybe i'm wrong maybe something else did move through here but we've had a quick look nothing at first glance and their behavior doesn't make me confident that there is in fact another predator here so let's stick with what we know and go back to that other big male we're finally going to have got back there now and he's going to have got up and moved. <laughs> Imagine that. I hope not. Either that or he's going to roar while we're gone. Um, James Richards, you have mentioned that it appears that our big boys the Birmingham boys, all five of them have been taking a bit of a, a beating while they've been away. And you're right. The first two that we've seen in a long while clearly have indicated just that. Just making sure there's no tracks of any other predators moving along here. There are some hyena footprints. But nothing else. Yeah, James, wouldn't it be wonderful to know exactly who they've been scrapping with and what exactly has been going on? Since they've been gone. Well, this lap is speculating that maybe it was a lady that gave him that big shiner under his eye definitely a possibility and it maybe was the ladies that have been banging them up a little bit whilst mating on top of that maybe they've been fighting over one or with one another over the ladies it certainly is possible hello boy what is full in your what has filled up your belly 
And who gave you that scar below your eye? Makes for great uh, defining characteristics on these animals. The more banged up they get, the easier, the easier they'll be to tell apart. That's one benefit. Even his legs, you can see, are full of little scratches. Maybe they've been t uh, having a few tussles with the two Matimba males further south of us, also possibly the Majingalan coalition, both of which are much older and established coalitions. They will be experienced, maybe not of as much youthful power, but certainly those two coalitions that I've just mentioned will have a lot of fighting experience over the Birmingham boys who are relatively inexperienced at being big and dominant. They've only come into this area recently. And you can even tell, I mean, his, his mane is not as big as it will be when he is at his prime. He's still on his way there. Oh, sorry if that offended you. I looked up kind of saying, what do you think? this is me in my prime. It's not gonna get any better than this. Interesting. So, Tommy Day, you believe that this could well be the line from last night. Thank you for letting us know your thoughts there. Let's check what's happening on the horizon there, Vim. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to capture that, but it looks like there's a thin sliver of orange revealing itself to us. Look at this. Good morning. Welcome to Africa. So thank you for letting us know that I didn't see any uh, images of that line that was seen last night. VM at first thought, uh, didn't think it was the same. That one also had a wound on his belly. Okay, VM mentioned that the, the one from yesterday also uh, had a big wound on its belly, Tom. And while we were on the other side of the this boy, we didn't see that wound. Um, I think it could have possibly been that he was lying on the wrong side. So, I mean, it is possible but we will reposition at some stage and get a closer look. It would kind of make sense to me that it could be him. The only reason I'm saying that is because of the movements and the area in which we found him coming from. It's possible that the, the lioness that the big male was moving with yesterday may have dragged him far to the west onto Sibambili or Arethusa. And once he had enough of that, he's now decided to head back to the area where they've been spending more time, which is, is south and east of us. So it's merely because he was with that one lady yesterday that would possibly have dragged him into this area. Okay, Gretchen in Illinois. Good idea. Let's put ourselves out of this misery and try and see if there is a wound on his belly. So we're just going to sneak around the other side of them. Pennsylvania for confirming that the individual from yesterday did, did have a gash on its belly. Now, which side of its belly is the question? You can see a large portion of belly here, and I can't see any skull here. Can you remember where on the belly do you think we can be certain? Difficult to be certain, judging by VM's eyebrows that are raised at the moment. 
as he clearly or carefully investigates this individual. I can see, I did earlier see a slight little piece of or flash of red under his front right arm, but now I've lost that angle. So I don't know, you guys let us know what you think. We can see a large portion of this very, very full belly, but no gash to be seen. It could, of course, be on the other side of his body that's currently pressed against the earth. Not clearly visible to us. Wasn't it wonderful that we saw the prince left by those massive paws just moments before finding him. C come on, boy, one more call would be wonderful for us. Hello, Georgie. And you would like to know how long does it take before, oh, look at those eyes. So would you like to know how long does it take for the line to become unfilled? And I'm guessing by this time tomorrow morning, his belly will be kind of in line with his hips and his shoulders. And then another morning, there'll be a slight concave to it, slight indentation. And then by day three, he'll be looking hungry again. So, 24 hours time, I think he'll look comfortable. Another 24, he will look slightly more hungry, and in three days time, it'll look like he needs another meal again. So they process the food quite quickly that they feed on. But as an average rule, I like to tell people from a full belly like this, and it could be fuller than this, he's not, he's not as uncomfortable as he could be, so, that indicates to me that he possibly could have stolen something like an impala. There's that bl bloody underarm. Interesting. He possibly could have stolen something like an impala. Hmm. Interesting. Ah, uh, Brian, you've mentioned that he also could have stolen something, so we're on the same page there. Now, interestingly, I was thinking along the lines of leopard. Maybe stolen an impala or something from a leopard. Very easy for lion to overpower leopards. They're not going to put up a, an argument. But you are under the impression, or, or thought process rather, of the fact that he may have stolen from other lions, and that's why he's looking a little bit battle-scarred. That certainly is possible. And if, for example, he had have bumped into the, the Inkahuma lioness, on a kill that they've freshly made. He will fight them for it. They're not gonna put up a huge fight against him. That would be unwise of them, but it certainly is possible that he would have delivered a few blows to get a hold of the Impala size prey. And Impala would fill his belly as we see it now. Or who knows, maybe they got a little portion of it. There were some young buffalo some of you may remember uh, seeing a small herd of buffalo yesterday evening just across on Arethusa. There was a young calf, a one-year-old calf and a mother. There could have been a few other females around, but maybe those buffalo came unstuck. Hello, Heidi, who is watching in Las Vegas. You would like to know if the animals ever get infections out here, just like our pets would. Um, wild animals are incredibly tough and resilient. I think a lot more tough in general than us or domesticated animals that have become more and more reliant on doctors and medication. They've, these wild animals have never had that luxury, and because of that, only the strongest and fittest genes get passed through to the next generation, and that kind of keeps them all in such fine form. That's not to say, though, that from time to time wild animals will not get infections. Of course, they, they can get unlucky if they 
get a wound and they're not very healthy, they haven't been feeding well, they're not in the best condition, they can become more susceptible to infection. But I don't think this guy needs to worry about that just yet. He's in fine form for now, but he is certainly looking a little, little bit banged up. Hello, Doodles. You've mentioned that you find the scars quite beautiful as they tell the story of his life. And I couldn't agree more with you, Doodles. That's a great way of putting it because it's important to remember that these animals do live very rough and rugged lives. A lot of the most well-known dominant male lions from various parts of the world. I know there's an individual called Notch in the Masai Mara. He's got some very telltale scars. There's another male lion also in the, in the Mara with one eye that's missing. So you'll find that a lot of the better known uh, big male lions of Africa that do roam areas like this, well, you know, areas that are highly safaried, um, they will have a few scars and tails to go with them. And I, I, li I like the fact that it helps us to distinguish them more than anything else, doodles. Um, I find it difficult to tell who's who uh, with these animals. So if they've got clear scars, that's a, a great indicator for me of being able to keep track of who is who. The only thing that I wish we could do is be able to capture some of these monumental battles and clashes that these animals have. And we'll get lucky one day. Um, we, we've been investing a lot of time out here, so I think we've been building credit for things like a, a male lion fight. So a, a few kills are definitely in, in the pipeline for us um, and I guess we just have to be patient and spend more and more time out here and that way hopefully we will get to see how exactly these scars come about. Now I fear that unless something bizarre happens that this boy is not going to be doing too much other than rolling about. I hope he proves me wrong, but I'm just trying to work out how much longer we should spend with him. Oh, yay, somebody saw the stomach injury there. So it could well be the same boy from yesterday, and I guess the fact that a tiny little roll revealed that is good news. At least we know who's who. He's moved a long way from where he was last seen yesterday evening. He was seen heading, let me, let me show you guys on my little map what, what, what he was up to. So, once I've showed you the mapping of where he was, in relation to where he is now, I'm gonna probably head off and go and look for the ladies. I, I've got a strong feeling that the ladies might be somewhere here on Juma, or at least it'll be nice to know where they've gone. So, for those of you who are new to the Safari Live experience, let me just start from scratch. The rectangle on the right is Juma. The rectangle on the left is Arethusa. These are the two properties that we can traverse. All the green areas around us are areas that we cannot go. Now, don't be fooled by our boundaries. Every, every boundary of ours is a road, so the animals have got free flow throughout this area, and the white area de demarcates 2,000 hectares of the 60,000 hectare Sabi Sands, which is open to the 3 million hectare Kruger National Park. We are currently the blue dots. The lions yesterday were seen walking up our eastern boundary, up this road here and then continued straight north into Bafelsuk. Now from there, I'm guessing they've headed west, 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 and then they must have come back, maybe past Sydney's dam over here, into Sibambili, possibly into Arethusa, and then this lion, let me zoom in a little bit, 
his tracks we found at this little junction over here, a little bit west of where we are. They were coming east along this road called Balanites to where we found them here. So I want to go and check around this area and see if we can't work out where the ladies are and what exactly has gone on. Let's take a look at them though. We'll spend a few more minutes here. Ben in Indiana, you have put yourself in the shoes or hooves of all the other animals that live out here and have mentioned that it must be wonderful to be a lion because you don't have to continue watching over your shoulder for possible threats. And it definitely is true, Ben. Um, they are at the top of the food chain. And the only other enemy that they're really going to have is other lions. So. I agree with what you've said wholeheartedly, but we do need to remember that they've received these scars from battles, and there will be times that they are scared. Probably not so much now, because they are in the height of their kind of dominance. But even this guy, you know, when he's not with the rest of his coalition, he could come up against three or four big old males that'll teach him a lesson, so... He's still going to have to have his wits about him, but he, like you say, there's a lot less chance of something going wrong and terrifying him. I guess what we do need to remember, though, is as terrifying as it may be to be a herbivore or prey animal, they have evolved to escape being fed on, and lions will only succeed 20% of the time as a general rule. Hello, Boyd in North Carolina. You would like to know if it's normal for this guy to be on his own or will he pair up with other, other males? And yes, he, he's, he's teamed up with four other males, probably from his natal pride, his brothers or cousins or stepbrothers. So they're all of similar ages. And he was very fortunate to be in that situation with his brothers or cousins because five males creates a very formidable team. It's a large, large coalition. You could say almost, not abnormally large, but they usually don't get much bigger than five, five males together. But then once they have come into an area and kind of reigned dominance, they will often split up and do their own things. I guess, you know, they've had the benefits of teamwork and then they like to go off and do their own things. One guy may prefer one water hole to another and one guy may try and get lucky with one pride of ladies while another may go off in search of others. So they do split up. It's not uncommon for, for, for big male coalitions to split up. That way they can also divide and conquer, in a sense, if their territory is massive, which five males will be. We, we need to get you over to James quickly. Till do. One wild dog just on the road up ahead. We spotted it around this place where we had that leopard killed in the tree just now, or yesterday evening. And just over this ridge, there was a wild dog standing in the road in Parlour. There's the, no, it's not a dog. There are hyenas running. There was a wild dog right in the road here. Here come the hyenas. Loads of impala over there. I think the dog's probably gone north. It was standing right where that young hyena's standing. Let's just watch these impala behind us are going crazy behind, or well, not crazy, but they're running. Something's going on here, definitely because the hyena have come running through here. What have you heard? Well, the 
the best thing to do in a situation like this when you're waiting to find out what's going on, you want to hear, you want to see, and you want to smell, is to just sit with the best ears, nose, and eyes in the bush. Because if those dogs do anything, this hyena will know about it. exactly like I feel. I knew something was going on, came herring out here. Watch the stone there, fellow. It's a young female, it's not a male. I'm going to leave her to carry on that way. There's another one up ahead. She's standing exactly where the dog was standing. She came onto the, onto the road. You can see there, there's a bush on the road there, just behind the hyena. And that is where the kill in the tree was last night. And I wonder if the hyena have not been sort of lurking around here, trying to get a piece of the kill out of the tree. And then the dog came by and they went crazy. And I'm afraid I didn't see which way the dog went. And that's simply because we had to come down into the dip and so we missed you know, we, we lost sight of the ridge here. Listen to the bird alarm calling at the hyena. But the hyenas are no, none the wiser. They're no more clued up than we are right now. They're doing exactly what we're doing, just listening. Smelling, looking. The wild dog, of course, smells very distinctive. Good morning, Mama. Thank you. The one thing, though, that a wild, uh, that a hyena cannot do, we don't think, is check for tracks on the road. So let's do that. That hyena is going to snooze there. Definitely they're around here because of the kill in the tree. And the dog obviously popped out. I'm sure the hyenas gave chase. And then it ran somewhere. I wonder if it didn't go south into Juma. The kill is in this tree here. There might be a leopard here. Smiles, you say, wherever that hyena goes, we need to follow it to the wild dogs. Well, we're going to do our best to do that, but before we do that, I just want to show you there is a kill in here. There are tracks of a male leopard as well, and we think maybe this male leopard is Kijima, the shy one who doesn't want to be seen by us. We we'll drive through here, see if we can't see him in the tree there. It's almost impossible to get a view, everyone, because it is so thick in there, and we can't drive any closer. But there is a steenbok or an impala in that tree. I don't see the leopard, though. OK, well, let's just go up a little bit further, turn around, and then we're going to come back down, see if we can spot the tracks of the dog. Tremendously exciting. My original plan was just to head to the hyena den. Tracks of the dog. Just one dog. Jared, I agree with you completely. It looked look, look like pretty. That hyena, the adult, the youngster, I think is probably the yearling born in February last year. I think a little bit small for June, at least big for June. There's tracks of one dog on the road here. There is a zebra. 
not looking particularly terrified by light. We just see it through there. We go past. So very difficult to tell what to do or where to go at this stage. I'm sure the dog would have popped along here. Probably just you know, there's, there's two of them in that dispersal pack. And then they, he would have, um, unfortunately for him, come across these hyena who would have stood up. And then he would have scarpered. Hmm. And I think absolutely, Brian, the wild dog would have been trying to get away from the hyena. Wild dog on its own, or with the two of them, will want nothing to do with the hyena. There's the hyena. Just listen for some alarm calls, perhaps. Of course, Impala don't make a great alarm calls at hyenas or at wild dogs. young hyena will be waiting, waiting, waiting for a piece of that kill to fall out of the tree. So just a quick summary while we sit here and listen briefly. Yesterday evening we came along here, Steph found a kill in a tree, he used his nose, and um, just inside before it's looking possible for us to drive in there, we can see the kill and we went home because obviously we didn't know or we couldn't see the leopard that had made the kill. We came along here now this morning and standing on the road just next to the kill would have, was the wild dog. And I'm sure as he arrived, these two hyenas leapt up from where they were hiding and probably went for him, and he's now disappeared. And all is complete silent and peace now. about the hyenas you say that you wish that they would stick around or stick together when the dogs are around because you don't know if they'll survive another attack they won't be as lucky as the scarback female was the other day it was just one dog but you can rest assured doodle that that situation that occurred the other night where or the other morning you know, that hyena was set upon by those 10 dogs and was unable to escape was unusual Normally, they will run away very quickly, and there's no point in the dogs giving chase, so they've just got to get away initially. But hyena hung around because it was a greedy guts, as Brian said. Okay, I think we should go back out onto the cut line. And then drive slowly backwards from the direction we came. Mercedes, you want to know about the relative sizes of a hyena and a wild dog. A hyena stands probably about three foot three at the shoulder, just over a meter. A big hyena, and a wild dog is shorter than that, an adult. Um, probably about well, two foot ten or so, maybe maybe three feet. But the size difference is marked in the mass. A mass of a hyena, a big female, is about 70 kilograms, which in pounds is about 160 pounds. And a wild dog is probably less than half of that. So they are much smaller. Wild dog is about Labrador sized. Yes, you, you say, are oh, they about Labrador sized? But a hyena is much, much bigger than that. not hang around. 
I, I was very fearful. As we saw it, I thought, you know what, if we go down the dip and up the other side and lose sight of it, we're not going to find it again, and that's precisely what's happened. And this road is so hard that to be able to tell where it went is almost impossible. But one other hyena went this way, so I think let's, let's kind of follow her lead, if you like. The den, the hyena den, is in this direction, though, so she might have just been going back to the den. I don't think the dog would have come this way because that herd of impala was just standing looking. And impala do not stand and look when there are dogs around. Hmm. Interesting times. Marvelous, you had that lion this morning. And he really, uh, for those of you who were watching last night, he's moved an enormous distance. Really sure why he would have done that console was. We found their tracks on the cheetah cat line, but then I couldn't really, till we knew that where he'd gone, and I think she's gone into Torchwood. Right, well, let's head down the next road. Hyena have a habit of being on their own when they're injured. Uh, Donna, no, they don't necessarily. But they will often go towards water and lie in the water. <laughs> you guys, while I explain to Donna what they do, um, Donna, they will go and lie in water and try and recover. Sometimes they'll go to the den to be around other hyenas. Look at this. What? <laughs> they kind of rile each other up. It's always a good idea just to stop and listen. So Donna, no, they don't necessarily make a habit of being on their own. Of course, they won't necessarily be accompanied, though, either. Lucky, it might pop out here, it might not. So, there were, we saw 
caught two dogs the other day, two young males, we think two young males, and they seem to be part of what we call a dispersal pack. Now, a dispersal pack is when, or occurs, when the pups from the previous generation in the pack decide to go off on their own and create their own pack. And they disperse in single sex groups. The males go off on their own, the females go off on their own, and they hopefully, with any luck, meet up with dispersing males or females from other packs. And these two males seem to be a little dispersal group. Another diker. There are diker all over the place. Is shouting, making a poor attempt at doing a Franklin ball. Yellow fronted canary. Just keep an eye on the Juma Dam Cam at the moment. Let's see if anything doesn't pitch up there for a drink. Hello, Whitney. While we're driving along looking at not much, you want to know about daylight savings, and if we have it here in South Africa, we don't. Um, we could probably have it here, but then we don't have anything like the same change in day length that you do at higher latitudes. So we don't have daylight savings. That said, the safaris will be changing times as we go closer towards the winter. You can already see in the mornings it's probably already a little bit dark. And so not too long from now, we will probably change to half an hour later, in the mornings at least. By the time midwinter comes, though, Whitney will be starting only at half past six. And then in the evening, we'll be starting at three. But that's only in the middle of winter. Okay, we're driving into the hyena den now. Maybe that pretty female, who we think is pretty, is heading this way. Such a mystery. And Lauren, you're in New York and you want to know at what age Dyker get their horns. Lauren, I actually have no idea, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to guess at probably about, I'm going to say three or four months, I think you'll find that the male's horns will erupt. Certainly they start erupting in Impala at about four months. In fact, they don't. They're, yeah, about four months. Four months in Impala, they start to erupt. And the dike are obviously much smaller, and therefore not quite as long-lived. So I would say roughly three months. Hyena calling way to the south. To the south is just over the back of the mound there. That's nowhere near where we saw Pretty and the other hyena. It's all rather interesting. I think what we're going to do is go out of here and head towards the Gallego uh, waterhole, past the waterhole, and towards the Gallego ship again. I just wonder if they haven't moved back there. So let's head back to Scott, get an update from him. Well, what a morning it's been so far. And uh, exciting stuff that you guys raced across to there with James. Now, we've just arrived at Sydney's Waterhole. We've been temporarily backtracking that big male lion. He came down the kind of western border of Juma, along a road called Impala Plains, for quite some time, and then we lost the track. So, not too sure exactly his route between then and where we are here, but I'm guessing he probably 
crossed into Juma somewhere a little bit to the east of where we are here. We, we're very close to the western boundary of Juma here. I just thought we'd pop in at this waterhole and see if there's anything interesting happening, which at first glance doesn't appear to be the case. I'm just having a quick scan with my binoculars. I mean, there could quite easily be a leopard or even lion lounging about somewhere in the general area, and from this distance it could be easy to overlook. But I've just had a sweep with the old binocular, and no joy. So, we shall be turning around and heading east, I think, towards the Buffles at Warthol. See what's happening over there. Phillips, hello and welcome on board. You would like to know what is the one thing that I would like to see before I leave, um, which is in the next. This is the eighth drive, eighth to last. Um, so in the next eight drives, what would I like to see the most? I mentioned yesterday that an African rock python is certainly on the wish list. It's one of my favorite snakes to see. Um, last night got lucky though, I forgot to tell you guys about this. Um, we went to go visit some friends at a lodge nearby and when we were on our way back, Nikki and I bumped into a puff adder along the, on the road. It was probably about that long, about 40, 50 centimeters. And had a great sighting of it. That was nice, but sadly you guys weren't with us for that experience. Yeah, an African rock python would be on the wish list, but if I could choose one sighting, uh, it would be the Birmingham Coalition or any number of individuals from there. Hunting buffalo. Lions hunting Cape buffalo is one of the most exciting things I think you can see on safari. It's an epic, epic battle between the two eternal enemies, they can both inflict fatal wounds to one another and that's why watching them fight it out can be a very thrilling experience and one that we've only managed to capture live once when Brett was in the right place at the right time to show you, some of you some remarkable images. For now, the puzzle is going to be pieced together as to what these lines have been doing. Let's take a look here. I've just found some lion tracks. And what is interesting is that it appears that it is just a lioness. Um, not easy to see here in this flat light due to the overcast weather. Let me jump out quickly and see if my flashlight isn't going to help show you these tracks a little bit better. Where are you, Vim? Are you on? Um, next one. This one. Yeah, that one. So... One more? Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, I'm not sure if this is helping at all, but when you shine a light at a low angle like this, you may be able to more clearly see the toes and the back pad. This is of one lioness. I'm guessing the lioness that was seen last night with that male. Now, they may have split up, at some point. Where could she be hiding now, though? That is the catch. Because we haven't seen any other tracks, but she does look like she's gone on to Juma. Huh. Interestingly, though, there's no sign of the male here, so maybe they split up before this point, which would kind of make sense. I'm just going to reverse a little bit and make sure she has, in fact, gone into Juma. There's a chance that she's been slinking in and out of this road. There, tracks go off. 
into Juma. She could at any point have slunk back onto this road in order to go for a drink at the Sydney's Warthol that we've just looked at. But I'm inclined to think that it's not necessarily the case. There is quite a lot of water around at the moment. Uh, check the fire break. You know, let's check the fire break. VM has just suggested that there's a fire break road that runs parallel to this road we're driving along here. So we'll do that quickly. Maybe we'll get lucky and bump into her. Hello, Lev in Brooklyn. You would like to know if a battle scarred lion will be less attractive to lioness? Not in the slightest. And even if you shaved off the whole mane of a, of a male lion and dyed his tail pink. If he was bigger and stronger than the other males around him and therefore dominant, he would get to mate with the ladies. So they're not superficial, or materialistic rather, in terms of appearances. They will mate with any male, whoever is the biggest and strongest and in the right place at the right time. I guess that's how it works, is through default, whoever is biggest and strongest will technically be in the right place at the right time in order to mate. Okay, now... I'm hoping that we're going to find the tracks of this lady popping onto this little fire break road, the next piece of the puzzle as we try and work out where she's gone. just bump into her, it'll be easier than trying to follow her footprints. Come on, where are you? Hello, Mohammed. You'd like to know, how can I distinguish between the tracks of a male and a lioness? And it's size mainly. Um, these tracks were a lot smaller than that big male's tracks we were looking at a little bit earlier on. And on top of that, both lion and leopard, the, the males will have a more rounded pad, back pad. Um, whereas the females will have quite angular back pads. So, slightly different shape to that you know, triangular pad on the back of the foot. Sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish the obviously young males whose feet aren't fully developed. Um, can be a little bit confusing, but in that case, I'm, I'm fairly confident that it was just one lioness as opposed to a young male. Okay, well, I'm gonna try and continue focusing on where this lady may have gone. And while we do that, we're gonna send you back to James. Ah, oh, cancel that. We're not gonna send you back to James. We are going to keep you here. The joys of live safaris, you do not know what it is going to happen, or when. And it sounds like they're having some tech difficulties across there. Well, I'm surprised that we didn't find any tracks of this lady coming out into the fire break, so maybe we just missed them. Hmm. Or possibly she walked over a very hard section of road, which would still mean we missed the tracks, but it just means that it's going to be very difficult to tell where exactly she did go. I'm going to turn around and go, and go back the way we, we've uh, come. 
I'm not going to invest huge amounts of time trying to track this lady down as we're not really in a position to be able to do it properly. If we were to do it properly, it's say goodbye to you and take a little handheld radio and set off on the trail, but that could take a long time before we come up with any results, and that way we would be leaving you stranded, essentially. So we'll press on, but just keep the mental note of where these tracks were, and maybe this evening, snooping around here, we'll get lucky. Birds in the sky, you'd like to know if we've got wild horses here. Yes, we do. They are black and white, and they are called zebras. They are the wild horses of Africa. Here we have the virtual zebra, or the plain zebra, but you also get the Cape Mountain zebra in South Africa, and a few different zebra variations as you spread further north up into Africa. My favorite zebra is the Grevy's zebra, which you get up in East Africa. It's got very thin stripes and very large ears, like a donkey almost. So those are the only wild horses that I know of. Um, I'm not sure if we get any other different types of wild horses, like a more regular colored horse. Look, the black and white variation, the pied horse. It's actually some of our horse tracks over here that I'd like to show you. All right, dog here, Vian. There we go. Perfect little horseshoe. So there's the outline of the horseshoe there, heading in that direction. Doop. There is, it looks like they've been up and down here though, because there's a few tracks also heading in that direction, so they're obviously having, there's obviously some horse play here. Ha ha ha. Kirsty would have loved that. It must be hysterical. Final control room now of my hilarity. Thank you, Kirsty, for confirming that. You can barely speak, actually. Gasping for air. Ah, what a beautiful morning. Cheryl in California and you say you've been joining in on the live safaris for just around a month now and loving every second of it so thank you and that is great news. You are interested to know a little bit more about our crew and what happens behind the scenes. Are there any pranksters that we have to deal with in camp? Um, kind of. I, I'll our boss, the, the, the big chief, Graham Wallington, he's a bit of a prankster. Um, there's actually a video, um, it, it'll be, it'll, it was quite a while back, it was probably a year ago that he performed this prank on me, but he decided to walk into my room while I was having a midday snooze, and he threw a bucket of water on me, or a glass of water on me, um, which didn't have the desired effect. I just rolled over and carried on sleeping. It was actually quite refreshing. It was quite a hot day. And most of the water landed on my laptop, which was next to my bed, which got him panicked. So there was a little bit of a prank uh, that was actually filmed that will be in some video somewhere. Um, Brent is also a bit of a prankster. Uh, he's got a cutout uh, of a life-size cutout on a thin piece of uh, wood of a hyena, and it's called Howard the Hyena, Howard Amnesi, and Amnesi is a hyena in Shangan. So sometimes Brent will strategically place this very uh, realistic 
cut out of a hyena. It's also got a, a, a graphic, a, a, a large sticker, essentially, of a spotted hyena on this piece of wood. And he had that once positioned outside my door, right outside my door, as I opened it early in, in the dark to come out on drive. I got the frights of my life and screamed at the hyena, hey! And he's also, me every time. He's also put it uh, near the bathroom at the DRC. Uh, which is the camp where most of the staff stay. And that's caught a lot of people. So I think Brent is leading the prankster challenge at the moment. He will be back from his leave, I think, on the 8th or 9th of uh, March. So just to keep you tabs on his movements, he looks like he's having a great holiday with Jamie, his lady, and Andrew Joe Francis, one of the cameramen, has also joined him there. We are going to, oh, I think I may have just found some electric tracks. The ground is hard here, though. Very, very hard. Let's just see if we can't work out if there are, in fact, leopard tracks. And then, if or not, we'll be able to show you any of them. Oof, I don't think we're going to be able to show you any, but a, a male leopard did walk here last night, heading backwards um, behind us, uh, not ideal for us, because we've just come from there and haven't seen the leopard. I'm not even gonna attempt to try and show you these tracks because the ground is just so hard here. You'll have to take my word for it. I'm gonna jump off just for a closer investigation and try and work out where he's gone. And while I do that, we're gonna send you back to James. Well, we have now checked the Gallego waterhole and the Gallego shortcut hyena den where there's definitely been no activity. This kudu has just happened to be on the road and she's, uh, she's rather splendid. She's uh, just chewing her cud, enjoying the sight of a human being in the morning as the sun breaks through the cloud. Perhaps she will spot a wild dog for us. Now, Scott is not too far from here, and I think that male leopard track that he's found that we've been showing you is quite possibly the same one that we were looking at when or was left there by the same leopard that has made that kill, just not too far from here on the Bivisal cut line. And we're just going to... I'm going to check one more hyena den site. And while we do that, we'll hopefully catch a spot of at least the tracks of that wild dog. I suspect, unfortunately, that the dog has scarpered north into Buffalo's Hook. Let's keep an eye out. I, I just don't know what's happened to the den. I don't know if they've moved, but the last three times I've been there now, there's been absolutely nothing going on there. And I find that very strange. And probably not coincidentally, it was after conflict. Firstly, with the lions. Remember, the lions discovered the den, and the one of them actually stuck her head into one of the holes where the pups live. And then, obviously, the big conflict with the wild dogs the other day. There's a there's a whole herd of them of kudu here. And the ex-ranga, I agree with you completely. You say you wish the hyena would put up a sign saying that they'd move to a new address and please forward mail. Well, yes and no. Uh, yes, because then we'd know where they are. Of course, the reason they don't do that is the parlous state of the South African Postal Service where the actual occurrence of receiving mail is, uh, well, it's about as dodgy as it gets. So I just think that they didn't bother because, you know, they knew that most of the letters get lost in the post anyway. And in the digital age, of course, all of those cubs will be using an iPad before they can speak. Not so, Brian. Mm -hmm. They'll probably be watching Safari Live right now. Right, I think that Kudu is in a compromised position. We should leave her.
important as always to stop and listen. Stop and listen. Let's see if we can't hear anything in the way of alarm calls, whooping from wild dogs trying to contact call each other. It's very odd that there was just the one. I'm sure part of that little dispersal group. see what else we can find through here. And I know it's become a bit of a safari cliche, but you truly just don't know what is going to be around the next corner. Just like with that lion today, although he was tracked, I suppose. Which, which animals makes which animals make me the most nervous when we go out? Uh, well, Gabby, to be honest, because I'm used to the area, um, I don't sort of go out with a sense of fear at all anymore. I certainly used to when I was a young ranger and I was on foot a lot and often unarmed. Well, I mean, being armed is obviously a very false sense of security out here. But we had to do unarmed walks as part of our training. And I used to be nervous of finding a buffalo on foot. I used to be nervous of finding an elephant on foot. And I, that's not to say that I don't live out here with a deep sense of respect and care for how animals are behaving. And so, of course, the animal that could do the most damage were to get particularly upset with you while we were driving would be an elephant. And so an elephant, we watch very carefully, we watch their behavior. If they start to look like they're feeling uncomfortable, we'll get into a position where we can extract as fast as, and quietly as possible. And then on foot, you always want to be careful of a buffalo because a buffalo will sleep quite soundly and you don't want to give them a fright and make them feel cornered because then they can be dangerous. But interestingly, the animals that we kind of don't worry about the most are the cats. And they just seem to habituate to us far more in the vehicles than the other animals do. And likewise on foot, they're very nervous of us. Okay, we're gonna keep checking up here for signs of the dogs or the hyenas. Scott's got some striped ponies for you. Let's go and have a look at them. Well, spirit in the sky, we have found the horses you were asking of earlier. Could even be the same individuals whose hoof prints we were looking at. Speaking of prints and tracks, um, we have established that the male leopard tracks that we had were those belonging to the leopard that made the kill that some of you may have got a glimpse of last night with James. It was just north of our boundary, and those tracks are heading directly away from that kill. I didn't know exactly where the kill was, so pieced that puzzle together as we continued east along our northern boundary. I've just turned... mm. Oh, I heard James. That's what they were listening to. Ha! <laughs> we were spying on them. They look quite focused, though. Um, to be honest, I wasn't expecting them to. They look quite organised there. <laughs> um, good. <laughs> I think James has come back snooping into this area, hoping to try and see that leopard. There's a chance that the leopard has headed off for a drink. That's why the tracks were heading away from the kill. I'm not, we had a look in that tree that the kill was in. Couldn't work out if anything was left. Didn't look like it though. Hopefully we can assist James in his quest to find that wild dog. It'll be so great if we do get to see a better view of the Manuletti pack. It's a pack of two, one of which has got a collar on it. So let's press on. Thank you, Zebbies. But wild dogs are such tricky animals to try and track down. I mean, even though you've got a glimpse of it, being right there, it 
it's difficult to work out where it's gone and they just moved so so quickly that there's a chance it could have crossed out of our southern boundary already even though we are on our northern boundary right now and that's where you had a glimpse of it i remember <clears throat> working in the southern sabi sands uh, the property that i used to work on had a border by a <coughs> I saw something there, but I'm dreaming. Um, and about a three mile width. And some mornings you'd get a report from the western neighbor saying, tracks of a pack crossing in at this road junction. And you race over there to get onto the trail. And before you even get to those tracks, your eastern neighbors, three miles away from the western neighbors, get all of you and tell you they've located the pack in the middle of their property. So they've gone straight through the middle of your property and the time that it takes to be found by the others. Bottom line is they cruise huge distances in very short spaces of time. Hello, Indiana James, you would like to know who is going to find the elusive birds for you when I leave. Well, I think all the other current presenters are doing a, a good job at it. It's luck a lot of the time. Some days you get lucky, other days the other presenters will get lucky. Just some more leopard tracks here. Again, of a male. You know, possibly Tingana's come into this area. It's a buffer zone, I'm guessing, between two different males' tracks. Um, or two different males there. You can see ever, ever so slightly a track. Just with a squirrel alarm calling now as well, which is naturally getting me excited. It's directly in the direction that these tracks are heading in. One more listen. You see, assumption can get you into trouble out here. You just see a track and you assume maybe it's not that fresh or maybe it's another leopard or not worth following up on. I think it's this Kojima oak camping out. Yeah, I think you're right, Vim. Judging by the size, I think this Mr. Gujima doesn't have the biggest of feet. His tracks aren't very big as far as male leopard goes. But I think you're right. I think he's just been snooping around this general area. users and the bottom line is there's going to be a new presenter that you guys all get to know and as I'm sure you've already worked out each different guide or presenter will bring different qualities or traits to a guiding team and I'm very excited for you guys to meet whoever does fill my spots because I'm sure that they're certainly going to bring you some new adventures some new angles on things and stories, new passions, and you'll just have to maybe, if they're not birders, you'll just have to force them into it, which is the beauty of these lives far is your questions and comments and thoughts help to guide us and steer us and essentially tailor make these safaris for you. So just keep up the comms and that way the presenters and guides will continue to deliver the goods for you. Speaking of which, let's send you across to Mr. Henry and see what goods he has in store for you. Now we are at the old hyena den off Aubrey's Road and there's very clearly been some activity here. There's nothing here now, but if you look at the ground, there are many, many hyena tracks. There are, there's definite evidence where they've been lying down. Now this 
I would say is no more than phew, from last night. I would say this is from last night. So probably worth coming to check here again. If, of course, the, there are cubs here, they will be down in the den and we won't be seeing them. Well, without the adults here. So it probably will be worth coming to check here again. The only thing I can think, though, is perhaps that this has become a sort of temporary resting spot when they have been foraging around um, the Fusfuk cut line. Now, the cut line is not far from here, and that conflict that they had with the wild dogs is only about three or 400 meters to the north of where we are now. Maybe they came back here and they sort of had a, a get-together afterwards, a celebratory whoop and squeak, and then moved on. I don't know, but definitely there's been some real activity here. It looks like young hyenas, small ones. Maybe the youngsters came back here, uh, had a bit of a rest. I don't know. It will be fascinating to see. So I think we must keep an eye on all the dens for the next little while. There's also, Brian, there's a beautiful bone there. Well, not so beautiful, but there's definitely evidence of fresh hyena activity. I don't know if you can see it over the edge of the car, can you? No, exactly parked in the wrong place. Hold on one sec, everyone. I just don't want to get out of the car if there are cubs here, because that will freak them out slightly. Otherwise, I would have just got out and showed you the bone. There is the bone, Brian. Can you see it? There is the bone. And it looks relatively fresh. There's still a little bit of stuff on it, so that's obviously been dragged back here fairly recently. Hmm. Time will tell, time will tell, it always does. In the meantime, in the meantime, let us go down towards Vuyatela Access now, I think. And then I'm going to head, I'm actually going to head towards Treehouse Dam and I'm going to check the hyena den that side as well. The one on Philemon's cut line, just in case. We'll be devastated if we lose these hyenas for any length of time. As many of you will know, I enjoy spending extended periods with them, watching their antics, trying to learn about them. Okay, here we go. Now, the day is starting to warm up a bit. It did start off quite cool, which is, I think, indicative of the fact that perhaps the major heat of the summer is over. That said, it is apparently going to get pretty hot today, up to about 38 degrees Celsius, which is pretty hot. But I don't think that we're gonna have any of those truly blindingly, unpleasantly hot days that we've had in the last little while. Yeah, there's lots of scraping from hyena in here. So I think that they've been using this either as a temporary refuge or as as a permanent one. I'm going to quickly, as we get out onto the road here, I'm just going to quickly draw you a map of where all these dens are. I think that might be quite uh, inst instructive, just so that you know what we're doing. Parked on a bit of a slope there. Put that there so you can hear what I'm saying. Take off my jugget. Now I need a stylus, um, probably a fine one and a, th a thick one. Get some moisture there, always a bit nerve-wracking as to know what the moisture might have been. Okay, so if we have Juma, we'll draw roughly as a triangle. That's the northern boundary, that's the Mifflesville cut line. There's the Cheetah cut line like that. Here is the Gari main road like that. And here would be the Triple M Road leading up to the Gari Gate. So, the lodge itself, <coughs> excuse me, the lodge itself is over here. And that's where final control is with Kirsten and Luisi at the moment. And there's the large stylus. What we have is Scott, basically, the last time you saw him, he was over here on the cut line where the leopard kill was. Hmm? Some of the vehicles cutting you off there. Is it? Yeah. Um, 
Oh, how deeply irksome. Uh, can you see here? Yeah. Okay. So, well, I mean, that's near enough. Scott was around there. There's the, we'll make the cut line there. Scott was around there with the leopard kill. Now, what we have is the three obvious dens that we know of. The first one, the Gallagher, or not the Mvubu Road one, is here. And slightly further it, this way is the Gallagher shortcut one. And then the one that we're just at now is over here. So three of them in a line, quite interestingly, and the Mulwati drainage line, which runs down the middle of the reserve like that, kind of splits it in half. And leading into that is the drainage line that runs off Philemon's dip. And the other den is over here. Sorry, the, the side over here. So that's where we're going to go and check now. Those are the four den sites that we know of. There was one also on Leadwood Road, which is over here. And that one was over there. So those are the five known denning sites of the clan of hyenas that we have here at Juma. Hmm. So quite interesting, really. What do you think, Brian? Fantastic. Better art than my normal. Your art skills are incredible. Better than my normal standard, yeah, I feel. Yeah. yeah. You improve it. Well, I mean, I just had to draw a square, really. Hey, a square and some dots. It's better than your last square. Yes. So yes. Better than my last square. Thank you. Some nice straight lines. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Right. On we go. <laughs> Kirsten gives me a six out of ten. <laughs> She might find herself with a eastern leopard toad in her bed tonight. Oh, Greg Levy, you're in Chicago. Want to know if it's a hyena cub or a hyena pup? Greg, anyone who calls it a hyena pup, you must um, point a finger at them and say, no, 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 no. It is not a pup. This is definitely a cub, and that is because they are more closely related to cats than they are to dogs, and that's why we call them cubs. And it's always a nice reminder, actually, of their distant relationship to dogs when we call them cubs, because they do look like dogs in some ways. Until you start studying them, until you spend an extended period with them, and suddenly you then see a dog and you realize that it's a completely different animal. It's amazing much more closely related to cats than they are to dogs. And indeed, even more closely related to the viverids like uh, civets and genets than they are even to the cats. Now that wild dog, of course, could have moved a substantial distance from where we saw him. So he could have come down here. In the meantime, Scott has got a shiny bird to show you. Hello everyone, this virtual starling's proving to be quite excited and it's flitzing about from side to side. It's very vocal. Grrr, listen to it calling. Come on, one more time. Well, maybe that's what it's excited about. It looks like it's found some ants to feed on. Grrr, are you trying to call your friends or? What's going on? Why the commotion? We're just rejoicing the beautiful morning. Oh, there's its friend in the background. And, oh, what did it catch there? Found something else. It looked like possibly a grasshopper, a slightly larger insect. Well, looks like they had a whole bowl of sugar for breakfast this morning, the way they bumbling about. Good, the Birchall's starling. Now, what's straight ahead of us on the road there? Am I seeing things? Yeah. I thought I saw something moving, that little kind of patch over there. 
Got my attention. False alarm. Mm, I was hoping it was going to be another long distance jackpot sighting like James had of the wild dog earlier. But alas, so we are approaching our eastern boundary. We've been traveling along our northern boundary um, and we're quite close to the Buffalo's of Waterhole. So we're gonna do a loop around back to that point where we might be lucky enough to get you a glimpse of the black crowned night herons. Some new birds that have decided to come and make this little pond their home temporarily. And it'd be wonderful to know where they came from and why they decided to kind of explore to try and find a new place in which to reside. They are also migratory herons. They are not always in this area. They can migrate further north into Africa. like to wonder about the animals that do move these huge distances and the incredible journeys that they have along their way. It would be an incredible thing to try and document the movements of a pair of birds or a whole flock of birds as they move from place to place on their migrations. Zoe, I'm very happy that you're concerned for poor old Viem's well-being after the vicious, the dangerous sighting that they were, him and James were in yesterday evening with the termite emergence. Yeah, I was lucky last night. Yeah, Viem says he's lucky to have got away unscathed after the huge threat that those termites posed to him. I think Viem uh, needs to go for some therapy to get over his fear for these harmless little creatures. They can't bite you, Zoe. I think Viem was just panicked by their numbers, their sheer numbers. There were thousands of these termites emerging from the, from the earth. I think that's what got him panicked. <laughs> But he is okay. He's just got a few little imaginary cuts and bruises from the termites. But he's just fine. Wasn't that a beautiful, beautiful scene last night? Good, James has found you some impala. Off you go. And the sun has broken through the clouds to cast a golden light on this little herd of impala. A young male there that you can see just over his second birthday no his first birthday sorry he would have been born in November 2014 mm. and it's so ooh, Brian look you see you see that female limping there There's a female with a serious problem on her right front leg. I think it looks like it's in the shoulder. She's limping badly. Now, any predator worth its salt will spot that a mile off. She can't run like that. It's actually the left front leg. Is it? No, it's the right one. Left. It's the left. Now, Lisa, roll on me, uh, quite a Twitter handle that. Um, Lisa, you want to know the difference between a horn, a tusk, and an antler. A horn is a piece of skull that has expanded into a spiky protrusion on the top of the head, and it is joined to the skull. It's ca covered in keratin, which is a very hard, kind of tough substance, basically like your nails. That's what a horn is covered in. And if it breaks off, it will not grow back again. So that's a crucial, important thing with a horn. 
a, an antler is something that a deer gets and it is not fused to the skull. It can fall off and in fact normally does fall off on a seasonally basis and goes, comes back again every year. That is distinct from a horn which is there permanently. A tusk is a modified tooth. So in an elephant or a hippo or a warthog, the tusk is a modified tooth. In the case of an elephant, it is an incisor, which is the front two teeth. In the case of a warthog or a hippo, the tusks are very enlarged canines. So I hope that gives an idea, Lisa, roll on me, as to what the difference between those two sort of, or th yeah, three different protuberances are. Sometimes for defense, often just for display. Oh, in the case of the elephant, a very useful tool. The warthogs, in fact, they dig with their tusks sometimes. Again, that kind of tension of the dawn is broken suddenly, just pop. And now we're replaced with a sense of peace and calm. Not so, Brian. Mm, very much The so. awe-inspiring savagery of the morning has gone. Mm. Now, the reason I say that is I'm not being facetious. Uh, we... <laughs> After that hyena and wild dog interaction we had the other morning, um, we decided, well, we better sort of film a little interview about how it made us feel. Um, well, 40 takes later, we still hadn't come up with anything that was vaguely usable. And Brian, I told him, I instructed him very carefully. I said, go home and delete those things because they are not to be watched by anyone. Well, I then heard howls of laughter coming from his room. And he was watching all of these takes, and it became apparent that what was so funny was that because I'm not sort of naturally demonstrative in an emotional way, it just looked so very fake to watch me going on and on about how the I was feeling a sense of awe at the savagery of the wilderness. And I was getting myself more and more worked up, and it just looked completely ridiculous. Brian, have you deleted them yet? No. Why not? Because they're great for entertainment value. <laughs> Are we making a blooper reel? I truly hope those things never see the light of day. Anyway, this is a zebra, as yes, obviously. For those of you who are very new viewers who've never seen a picture of an African animal, this is an awe-inspiring, savage zebra. And they are quite savage, actually. They can be really vicious. There seem to be many, many zebra around at the moment. I was just commenting to Brian that there are no elephants at the moment, but zebra are all over the place. And I think they've come out, of course, largely into these open areas because there's a bit of grass for them to eat now. They need fresh grass. And they're all looking pretty healthy. We saw yesterday a very interesting sign of the drought. And I thought, you know, the drought will reach a tipping point where suddenly you will start to notice more and more and more animals that are starting to look a bit ill, they're starting to lose condition, they're starting to lose skin, um, they're starting to look skinny. And a steenbok the other day, which is a concentrate feeder, needs highly concentrated food, flowers and buds and underground rhizomes and that sort of thing, starting to look very skinny. The bulk grazers, like these zebras, are still handling okay. The impala, which are able to browse as well, they're still handling all right. Yes, I'm talking about you. Yes. Hello. How are you? Oh, now, Mac, on Twitter, you've asked a very interesting question, which I'm not convinced the final control understood. Um, you want to know if there are... <laughs> I've just had it in the air from Kirsten. She did understand it entirely. Uh, you want to know if there are any animals out here that are coprophagic. Now, coprophagic is 
an animal that eats its own dung. And actually, those zebra are quite known for coprophagy. They eat their own dung sometimes. Horses, we know, do it. And it's because it's normally the animals that have hind gut fermentation or less than efficient digestive systems that will eat their own dung. And so uh, the most obvious example is something like a scrub hare, which does it by default. A scrub hare will eat, swallow, and then it will produce a kind of um, lubricated white pellet that it will eat directly out of the anus as it comes out. And then when it comes out the next time, it's a much drier, darker pellet. And that's the kind of dung that you'll see around from a scrub hare. Zebra in tough times, drought times, will eat their own dung, absolutely. Remember, they are hindgut fermenters, which means they don't re-chew their food, which means their digestive systems are not nearly as effective as a, well, effective is the wrong word. They're not as efficient as a ruminant's digestive system, which means there's still quite a lot of nutrients in the dung when it comes out. And the best example of that, of course, is an elephant, which produces dung that apparently is about only 40% digested. And hippo, especially, are very fond of eating elephant dung. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, coprophagy only refers to the eating of your own dung as opposed to another. So I'm not sure that we'd call what a hippo does coprophagy. Wonderful question. Thank you, Matt. And there will be lots of different kinds of phages as the uh, drought wears on. Uh, animals will engage in geophagy, the eating of sand and stone to get minerals. Osteophagy, the eating of bones or sucking of bones, which a lot of the herbivores do here when they get a bit short of phosphorus or calcium in the diet. Uh, what other phagy might there be, Brian? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your awe-inspiring contribution to this conversation. <laughs> We're going to leave the discussion of phages now and move on, hopefully down towards the hyena den. Now, we did have tracks of those male leopards that came and drank at the pan earlier, but I don't know where they went from there. We'll just keep looking around here as well. Cassandra, you are in Malawi doing the Lord's work. You are a missionary in Malawi, and you want to know how far away you are from us, basically. Malawi is a goodly distance, I'm afraid. Uh, you're basically three countries away. So we've got South Africa at the bottom of the continent. I could draw you another picture. Um, um, possibly I won't. We've got some South Africa. Now on top of South Africa, you've got Namibia. Next to that, you've got Botswana. Next to that, you've got Zimbabwe. And next to that, you've got Mozambique. And then above that, you've got Zambia. And sandwiched between Zambia and Tanzania, we have got Malawi. So as the crow flies, you're probably about, what would you say, Brian? About a thousand miles or so from us, maybe? Yeah. Oh, probably about 1,600 kilometers, maybe as much as 2,000 kilometers. So not a gentle stroll down here, Sandra, but you can certainly fly. Many flights out of Lilongwe into Johannesburg. In fact, I suspect you probably had to fly through Johannesburg to get to Malawi. I'm fascinated that you have sufficient bandwidth in Malawi to be watching this. That's great, really nice. Okay, let's head it back across to Scott, who is also awe-inspired at the raw savagery of the wilderness, and uh, I think he's looking at an ant or something like that. Well, James, he is certainly a wordsmith. Take a closer look here quickly. Yay! <laughs> I really do love hornbills. They are the cartoon characters of the African wilderness, and how cool is that call of theirs when they hold their wings up high above their head? They did it just a few seconds before you joined us. So let's see if they don't do it one more time. It sounds like they're building up for another one. Here it goes. Huh. 
Oh, farted one there. Come on. That's me speaking to them. Yeah, we need Brian the Bird Whisperer, although I may have torn a few pages out of Brian's bird whispering notebook. Come on. <laughs> Put the wings up. Come on. Maybe I'm confusing them. Maybe they're just laughing at me. Yeah, I guess this says I've got the wrong accents. My voice is too high pitched. <laughs> Very good. Now, we have found some more lion tracks that appear that they've come into Juma, off Cheetah Katla, our eastern boundary. So now, we are looping around onto the next road that runs parallel to Cheetah Cut Line to see if they don't come any deeper into Juma. If not, we may head back to the last tracks and take a short walk into the block. They could be snoozing between the roads, so time will tell, but it's an exciting prospects, obviously, if we can find two different sets of line on the property, we'll have a very good foundation laid for the Sunset Safari. Here we are turning onto the Rockensburg Road and this is the road where I'm guessing we may find some of their tracks. Oh, there's a cool bird that just flew across right in front of us. I don't know where it landed though, where did you see it land? No. It's a very secretive bird, sadly, called the grey-headed bush shrike. We'll continue. I can't see it anywhere there. Sure, somewhere in that direction. You have seen a couple of them, I know. I think James had one quite recently for you guys. <clears throat> so the tracks we are expecting to come from right to left. I had a brief look. We could see where the lions had been sleeping on the road. Those large swish marks where their tails had wiped the sand kind of smooth as they lounged about. And then they got up and it looked like they headed straight into Juma. There's catches while I'm scanning down on the road for tracks. Obviously I'm not having my head up and we could drive straight past the line, but thankfully VM it's got eagle eyes, so I'm confident that he's got that angle covered. All I'm seeing is hippo tracks going down the road. It's remarkable that we're seeing hippo tracks all over Juma, yet there's not one hippo residing on Juma at the moment. And it just shows that they are having to travel very large distances from their water sources in order to find enough grass to graze on. <coughs> that these lions may have just headed towards Buffles or Waterhole. Their tracks would need to have changed direction a little bit in order for them to do that. I wouldn't say they're exactly heading directly there, but they're not too far away from it. We could get lucky and find them there. In terms of who it could be, maybe the <clears throat> four in Kuhuma lioness that were in this general area a couple of days back. So I would have expected their tracks to have popped out now, but no joy. Now what that means is not necessarily a bad thing, through the process of elimination we've worked on that they haven't come this far. So. If we do go back to the last tracks and do find that they actually do come into Juma and they haven't just eluded us, then they will hopefully not be too far away. It's a very thin strip of vegetation between this road and Cheetah Cut Line. So it'll be a relatively easy tracking exercise if we can work out that they are in this little block.
So, some of you will be aware of the crab. There is a crab that lives in a little mud wallow. Um, that one of the old presenters, Mark, um, informed me about, and there's discussions and debates as to what we should call it, but James has mentioned that I need to be the one to name it. And there's some, already some names. George is one of them, George the Crab. <laughs> um, and that was James's suggestion. Uh, Brian's suggestion is Mr. Crab. Uh, <laughs> Both of them are very good, very good names that I like, so. <laughs> well, maybe we could call it uh, Mr. George the Crab, Mr. George Crab. Um, yeah, let's think about that. What's the, what's the singer's name? George somebody. Ah, slipped my mind. Oh, George Michael. But that doesn't work. We can't work. George, no, it's not going to work. It was George Michael. Thank you, Kirsty. We can't squeeze crab into there anywhere. So have a little play on George Michael. Crusty the crustacean, mm -hmm. that's nice. I think that was Lou, possibly, sitting next to Kirsty in the final control. No, that is Kirsty. <laughs> anyway, you guys send us through your thoughts on what we should name the crab. I'm needing some help. I'm not my, the creative juices in my brain don't seem to be flowing very well this morning. So no lion tracks, so please do though, send us through your thoughts on what we should call the crab. I feel like we should somehow try and incorporate uh, Mark in, in this whole naming, because if it wasn't for Mark, none of us would know about it, because he was in fact the one that pointed it out to me, so if we can somehow pay homage to Mark Weiner, who was the initial discoverer of that crustacean. So... Just about to reach the buffers of quarter hole, so... Once we popped in there and had a quick look, made sure there's no one here, we will be sending you back to James, and then I'm going to head back to those lion tracks and probably take a short walk to see if we can't establish exactly where they have gone. First glance. It would be wonderful if we could find a crab here to take across to that lonely individual that we've been speaking about earlier. Good, well, nothing to see here, so back to James and we're gonna go and snoop around those lion tracks. Good. Now, we are just arriving, everyone, at the very old hyena den, and I don't see anything in the way of tracks, but I didn't see tracks the last time I visited here, and that was when we found Porky with her two little babies. So we're just going to ease gently up towards the den site and see what's going. And there's a spot on the lens, Brian. I don't see it. Sort that out. I don't see it. Coprophagy. Now, lots of impala tracks around here. Not much in the way of anything else. 
Brian's just trying to find the spot there. He's doing a blanket cleaning. <laughs> I think that's good. OK. The spot is gone. OK. Yes, thank you, Brian. That's, that's quite enough. No, definitely nothing going on here. No hyena tracks, no fresh activity at the actual den site. But well worth just having a look. The hole is still quite deep in there, but you can see that there's no, well, there's no kind of scuffed up dirt. Definitely not even one hyena track coming through this area. Okay, so we know they haven't moved here. We do know they've been around the Aubrey's one. So time will tell. All righty then. There's a little bird there. I think you're too high. I think you're going to be hidden. Can you see it? No. I think, yeah, it's going to be that there's a branch direct in your eye line. I'm just going to try and roll forward. And don't move, little bird. You have moved. I want to punch you because you have moved. I think it was a red-backed shrike. Female. Gone. There it was. Did you see it? I don't know what it was, everyone. You got it there, Brian? Ah. Uh, it, it is a female redback shrike, everyone. Yes, you can see that almost kind of hollow black eye. That's quite indicative of the female redback shrike. I can't actually see it with my powerful binoculars. but I'm 99% sure that that's precisely what it is. Good. Now, James Richard, you wanted to know about arthritis and whether animals get it out here, because you know they do get it in zoos, but perhaps, you, as you correctly say, simply because they live longer lives in a zoo. I am... James, I would say, I think you're probably right. I think the increased li life span of a sort of zoo-bound or captive animal probably has a contributing factor. I think you'll also find, though, James, that it has quite a lot to do with diet. Obviously, if you keep, for example, an impala in the Denver Zoo, it's not going to be getting the same minerals and things and trace elements that it gets in its natural diet. That will have an effect on it, the body's ability to heal itself. They are so finely attuned to, you know, they've evolved in an area like this where there's such a specific suite of nutrients, and we don't know what all those nutrients are. We can make a rough approximation, but we still don't, I don't believe, have any idea exactly what nutrients an impala needs in order to make its life healthy. And so I'm sure that there is a nutritional aspect to the arthritis that occurs in zoos. And then, of course, I think there's the obvious thing of exercise. Animals here move around a lot more than animals in zoo environments. And they move around when they feel like it. They move around specific times of the day and they do specific actions that they cannot do within zoos. So I think you'll find that those three things combined probably contribute to the existence of arthritis in captive animals where it doesn't occur in natural, in, well, in wild animals. Well, I think it probably does a little bit. I'm sure it does, but not to the same extent. And I mean, a domestic dog or a domestic cat's a brilliant example of it. Um, even some breeds, and, and you know, the more highly bred an animal is, the less it seems to, the less long it will live. And so, you know, a highly bred dog, like an Irish wolfhound, for example, none of whom, this is an interesting fact for you, no Irish wolfhound lives beyond the age, I think, of seven years old, seven or eight. All of them die of liver cancer. Now, 
apparently every single one of them will die of liver cancer eventually. And that is fascinating to me. But it's just indicative of how captivity and overbreeding, or you can call it overbreeding, or you can call it selective breeding, has created a system where there's just not a resilience to disease. And I think that would probably be the same with some captive animals too. A lot of captive animals would have been bred in captivity and not bred in the wild. And I think arthritis is a nice example of a disease that could be extended to many other diseases that domestic and captive animals get. Animals out here just don't. I think cancers are one of them. We know that domestic animals, uh, lots of them, especially highly bred domestic animals, suffer hugely from different cancers. Whereas the animals out here, I just don't believe that they do. We don't see them with tumors. Well, once or sometimes we do, but very, very seldom. I think it's got hugely to do with the uh, nutrition that they have. It's got hugely to do with the atmosphere that they live in. I don't think we should discount either that the, the atmosphere of tension or, I mean, the different energetic atmosphere in a human home or a zoo compared with the energetic, energetic atmosphere out here must be very different. And that will cause physiological changes. It will have a physiological effect on all bodies. I can't believe how green this has got. Hey, Brian? Green, green, verdant fields. It looks like the valleys of Wales. Well, not quite, but get my meaning. So this has now become prime habitat. Prime habitat here because it's green and we're heading towards a waterhole. And so if I was a impala or a zebra or a wildebeest, this is where I would be lurking about the place. As long as there weren't any lions about, but there was a lion about here, we know that this morning, not too far from where we are now. I just love the way the light comes bucketing through the grey clouds and just bathes us in gold. Joe Angelo in Los Angeles, you are interested again in sort of the danger and what animal is likely to show the most surprise aggression? That's an interesting one. So basically what you're asking is which animal is the most unpredictable? And I, I was told something once and I've always stuck by it. I think it's a really good thing. The chap who trained me said, no animal is unpredictable. They all actually behave in an entirely predictable fashion if you put them in your own, in, if you can climb into their shoes. And I believe that to be true. I believe that most animals out here will behave in an entirely predictable manner if you're able to understand the pressures that they're experiencing at the particular time that you're looking at them. Now, that said, behavior can be difficult to interpret and it's then, of course, that a surprise can happen. And I think, and also, you can find an animal with, whose mood will change very quickly. And I think, for that to be the case, animals that have the greatest sort of uh, range of emotional activity or emotional uh, expression would be the ones that would be the most unpredictable. And therefore, Brian, I would say an elephant would perhaps be the animal that would show the most surprising responses to, to a situation. So I would, I would go with elephant, Joe Angelo. But remember, aggression is only a function of threat. Very few animals, in fact none, other than human beings, are aggressive just for the sake of being aggressive. Here is Treehouse Waterhole, where a great mass of nothing is having a drink. There is a uh, emerald spotted wood dove. There. Little emerald spots shining. And Brian, there's some birds up in the top here, up above those weavers' nests, and I thought they were weavers. But they are not. They are very angry, angry sisticulars. I think they're angry with each other. Although, There's a bird party going on. 
there's the cysticula. And then, Brian, if you, can you see where there's, there's a great conflagration in that silver cluster leaf way across over there? And there's some babblers and there's some southern black tits. There seem to be some rollers shouting as well. And I don't know if they're alarm calling or if they're just having a party. I'm just looking with my powerful binoculars into the, into the depths of the wilderness there to see if there isn't perhaps a lurking leopard. Or a wandering wild dog. Let's go around there. What should you say, Brian? Mm. Let's pop around there. This damn wall is bad news. Hello, Siberia Zumi. You want to know which birds <laughs> migrate all the way from Scotland, that's quite a specific country, or northern Europe? Well, into this area from northern Europe would come the steppe eagle. They come all the way from the steppes of Russia. Um, what else would come? I think the willow warbler. I think most of our star are not starling swallows, which would, which I mean, you do get the barn swallow in Britain and in Scotland, but apparently the ones that come here don't go back there. They go back into I think it's southern Europe. So although the same species does make that migration. The ones that come here don't go all the way there. Let's just drive slowly through here. So some of the warblers, um, and then of, of course the ones on the coast would be the obvious ones, Siberia, the, the terns. Some of the terns and the, I think you'll find the sandpipers, the turnstones, they would be the ones that come all the way from either, even north of northern Europe. But into this area, not that many. Maybe the sandpipers would be the obvious one. I think this is just a party of birds. I don't think they're alarm calling. I think they're just having a real good time. So you hear the babblers going. You hear now an orange-breasted bushrike going. There's a huge amount of bird song, but it's not concentrated. It's all over the place. I don't think anything particularly terrifying has got their attention. I'm going to go a little bit forward, turn around, and then head back towards Twin Dams. See if we can spot that orange-breasted bushrike. He is a magnificently colored bird, and we often get asked about colorful birds. He is one of the most colorful there. He is He's in there. I think that's him. It is. Oh, and he's in the top. Yeah, that's him. He's in the top of that acacia tree there. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. Oh, he's gone. No, he's flown away. Sorry about that, everyone. Bad luck, Brian. They are very secretive, those birds. This is the site of my first meeting with Amber Eyes all those months ago, Brian, when she looked me up, stared into my soul. That she is not here right now. tracking something. He's off the car. Maybe that female lion from last night. Somewhere around Bivol's Hook, I suspect. Unless he's, unless he's tracking his black crown night heron, which is quite possible as well. So we'll carry on towards Twin Dams, where there is no water, despite the fact that there is water in this one and in Bifelshoek, Twin Dams has not managed to retain any moisture at all. And I'm 
really hoping this cloud is going to last a bit longer. I don't think it is. I think it's going to tear up and really burn down on us today. And that is going to dry up this small gain we've had, the small indent we've got into the drought. It's going to dry up in the face of the blinding African sun. But the sun will start to ease off as we go towards the autumn. doesn't know with the weather these days, does one, Brian? No. Oh, there's some grey helmet trikes in here. There's one. There's a whole little flock of them in here. There they go. <laughs> you see up there, Brian? In the dead part of the tree. A really nice shot of one. But they so seldom sit still, everyone. That is the grey helmet trike. It used to be the grey helmet trike. I cannot ever remember its new name. And it's not a new name anymore. I mean, it's almost 20 years old. White crested helmet trike. White crested helmet trike. And they live in a little flock. And actually, quite interestingly, social structure not dissimilar to that of a wolf pack or a wild dog pack with an alpha pair that will breed. And the youngsters from a previous generation will help raise the new fledglings or new nestlings. And then they will disperse, I think, if I'm not mistaken, also in single sex groups and make their own little flocks. I think they're rather sweet. And they will nest in a tree hole, so I wonder if their nest isn't somewhere around here. And I'm sure these are new fledglings from this year. The white crested helmet shrike. And it's called a helmet trike because apparently it looks like it has a helmet on it. I sort of see that, I suppose. Just look at the flexibility in that bird. I've been watching birds a lot lately and been so impressed by the way they balance, the way they hop about, this power to weight ratio that exists in a little bird like that. But the flexibility the way the head is able to turn, the incredible angles. Now remember, that bird is constructed not dissimilarly from you. Yes, I know you can't fly, but it still has a skull onto which a spinal column is connected. But it is connected, obviously, in a much more delicate fashion, and it is also connected in such a way that it is immensely more phys um, flexible than ours. Look at the way the head can turn, the speed with which the nerves tell those muscles to move. I just think it's, in, it's incredible. I feel completely physically inadequate when I'm out here watching birds like this, or any of the mammals as well. Mm. What a wonderful little sighting of white crested helmet shrikes. On we go. I wonder if they didn't, weren't actually born in that tree. Right, let's head back across the Scott. He's tracked whatever he was tracking. Let's find out what it was. So, uh... A successful little tracking mission, or kind of. Um, the lions moved off our boundary into Juma, as we assumed, and they did actually, in all likelihood, cross over Drakensberg Road, the road that uh, you were checking with me, but I missed those tracks. Um, so now we're checking Gwari Pan Road. It's the next road in the general area that those tracks were heading towards. Tricky business tracking as well as keeping you guys entertained. So that's why I am back on the vehicle. 
ideally I would have stayed on that trail until we found it, but that could take a long time. So we're kind of taking shortcuts here. This is not a good example of how to track. Just to clear that up with you. Oh yeah, we've got some tracks here, so we're getting lucky. <laughs> oh, I saw a track back there. Oh, yeah, okay. Good. Well, let's hope they've obviously popped onto this road now. Yeah, I was looking for one. They could be around any corner. It looks like it's definitely a male or two. Oh, this is a nice male track here. I'm seeing on this side, but there could be some ladies around. Who knows? Let's find them and hopefully find out. Safari Dean's suggestion for the crab, and that is pinchy. I think that's kind of catchy. So maybe we can call it pinchy, pinchy Weiner after Mark Weiner, who first established the sighting of that crab and introduced me to it. So yeah, I don't know what you guys think, but maybe Pinchy Winer, that way we're incorporating Safari Dean's wonderful idea, as well as not forgetting the person who made all this crustacean goodness possible, Mr. Mark Winer. So Pinchy Winer it is, I think. We'll run it through James and Mark's, uh, sorry, James and Brian, see what they think. is still moving down this road. Quite a tricky road to track down. It's quite hard. It doesn't look like it, VM. Yeah, VM also hasn't seen anything for a while. Anyway, at least we know that there was a line moving through this general area. Come on, where are you hiding? Yeah, the road softened a little bit, so maybe... Let's make the most of that. No. Interestingly, we had tracks of a male leopard heading away from Buffalo's or Quartz Hole. Also tracks of a female leopard in this general area, so there's been lots of action in this northeastern corner of Juma. So much happens out here without us actually knowing about it. Come out in the morning and just assume that there's not too much going on. Let, uh, little do we know though, there's been a hive of activity while we've been fast asleep. Hoping that other male line that we found earlier this morning is going to sing for us tonight. I was chatting with VM earlier. Good prospects. I think that's all we can hope to expect from him with that very full belly. I'm doubting he's going to be able to do too much more than possibly sing. But I hope he proves me wrong. You know Affirmative Ephraim, it was not active. Ephraim, one of the other guys, was just asking if the hyena den was active. As you guys know, it wasn't when James stopped in earlier. That's not to say that wouldn't have changed by now, so he's going to head across there and just double check. Let's 
So, um, some of you are wondering if we are going to head back to that big male line before the end of drive. I think that's Gale in Nebraska. I have Carol. Hello, Carol. Um, Carol, I don't think so. Uh, James might uh, pop past there, but I don't plan to. I prefer to look for some other lines or some other action because I really don't feel like he's going to be up to anything vaguely exciting. I think he's going to be passed out. So probably not, but we'll definitely be spending a lot of time with him this evening once it cools down. James has found some monkeys. Woohoo! <laughs> Woohoo! Indeed, we have found some monkeys. They're standing at twin dams under a very unusual tree. It is unusual not because of its species, but because of the way the trunk grows. You see that? In almost a perfect twist. And no one knows why that should be the case. I've never seen a tree like it. Let us go a little closer for the monkeys. Now, this troop will be very different from the one that hangs around and robs us at camp on all, an almost daily basis. Jeepers, did you see that thing jumping out of the tree there? They will be very shy of human beings. So in the absence of human habitation, monkeys are very scared of us. But they quickly lose that fear around human beings if they manage to steal food from you. Some of them will be hiding in the, there's one, there's a really nice shot. I see this tree is starting to fruit. The jackalberry is starting to fruit. And that little one there, I think, is probably eating some unripe fruits. There's one right above us as well. That's very cool. These are actually delicious fruits, everyone. And they're the reason that the, or the reason they, the, Jackalberry has its term, it's beautiful, has its name. Go on, I'm getting totally tongue-tied. The reason the jackalberry is called the jackalberry is because of the sweet fruits is eaten by the side-striped jackal. So I hope that they ripen fairly soon. I also saw a green pigeon flying out of here. They are highly frugivorous birds. Now, Ming Yu, you say you've been wondering when you might see a monkey. We do see them less frequently than you might expect, but they are around. The one primate, of course, highly entertaining, if you can find them, is a baboon. But we don't see baboons here very often at all. And that, I think, is because trees of this size, which would be the ideal kind of um, roosting spot for a baboon, don't really occur at Juma because we don't have a flowing river. But all along the major rivers of the Kruger, you will find baboons roosting. And um, they obviously are also, much like the monkeys and their human relatives, uh, very good at living in sort of urban environments. And then Brian, oh, he's gone. There was a big male on the ground, but he's, he's moved off. We'll try and find some ripe jackalberries to share with you, but I think it'll take another little while before they ripen fully. They look very green at the moment. Certainly this tree, I mean, this tree looks laden with fruit. Far more so than any of the marulas we saw this year, which were basically very pathetic in their efforts to produce fruit. Not their fault, of course. A large drought being the result.
And I think this is possibly the most magnificent tree on this reserve. <laughs> Beautiful scenes there of the sky through the jackalberry. There we go. Now you can see them eating. They won't mind unripe fruit, unlike us. And Liz in Wisconsin, do you agree that this is a, an amazing tree? I think this is the best tree on the reserve. I say, there, look at all those fruits in his hand. Look at his hand. Such a human hand. Brian, here comes a tiny little one. Knows it's been spotted. Oh, it's run away. It didn't want to be on camera. Sorry to disturb you there. They've got the most human hands. I'm actually getting quite peckish just looking at those fruits. I don't think we'll go in and take one. Let's go a little bit forward. In fact, let's not. Let's just watch this for a little while. James Richard, you're asking about something called a snackberry bush? Is that right, Kirsten? Oh, snotberry bush. Uh, no, there aren't. I've seen one at uh, Ngala, which is not too far from here, but a snotberry I haven't found over here. They've got extremely um, uh, sandpapery leaves, and they do sometimes go on termite mounds, but I've never seen one here. But if we do come across one, perhaps a first, I will certainly tell you about it. James Richard, that's quite an odd request. You must be um, highly skilled, sorry. Were you recording there, Brian? Let's be. Let's just go a little bit forward. Now, Lisa, roll on me. You want to know if this tree flowers? Yes, they do flower, otherwise they couldn't produce fruit. But the flowers are very small and indistinct. So just tiny, tiny little sort of greenish flowers. So you would hardly know about them. Uh, I see you. I see you, monkey. You know that I see you. He's sitting in a leadwood tree. You can see totally distinctive bark. I'm not sure why they'd be in this tree other than if they were trying to fish grubs and things out of the, the dead branches where the, the bark has sort of died. They might be trying to fish out some grubs and things from there. They're truly sort of omnivorous. Plenty of insects, plenty of fruit. Maybe even the odd bit of carrion. Isn't he lovely with his ears? Little black face. They look so sweet and harmless. And apparently, if you were to ever try and catch a wild monkey, they would unleash a reign of terror on you, the likes of which you couldn't imagine. And then there's something else in the car here. Amazing fellow. A longhorn beetle with the most spectacular colors. Yellow and blue. Yellow and iridescent navy blue. Wow we not that amazing. <laughs> This is a beetle. So not traditionally what people would think of as a beetle, but he is a beetle. He's a member of the order Coleoptera. There he is. He knows something's up now, you see. He's staring at me and trying to intimidate me with his long horns. <laughs> hmm. 
He's so cool. There he goes. Now, I don't know if you saw that, but what he does is he's got, he's, he's, he's got these things called elytra, which are basically modified front wings. So most insects, or a lot of, especially the primitive ones, have got two sets of wings. They've got front wings and back wings. The most obvious example of that would be something like a dragonfly. You can see that they've got four and hind wings and even a, a moth or a butterfly. Now, in a beetle, that the front wings have been modified into what we call a elytra, and that is basically a hard shell casing. So they don't, they're not used for flying at all. And so when you see a beetle take off, what it does is these elytra lift and move, and then the wings come out from the back and off it flies. It's an amazing kind of adaptation. And somehow they fold the, and the wings are often big. You know, to fold them back up underneath, and then they fold the shell back down. That's what happens with them. We're going to head off to Leadwood Road, not too far from here. Let's go across to Scott, get an update from him, and we'll see you later. So some serious action unfolded on Juma last night. Now I've just heard an update on the radio from Ephraim, one of the other guides, saying that he found a drag mark. Now, a drag mark is a mark on the road where something has been dragged. Usually, the something that is being dragged is something that is dead, usually being dragged by either a leopard or a hyena. Those are the two animals that will typically drag animals around. Hyena will drag kills that they've stolen away into an area where they can feed on them, sometimes back to, the, to their den sites, but I've never seen any chunks of meat being brought back to a hyena den, so... I think they just go and stash them somewhere for their own private enjoyments. Interestingly, what appears to have happened, though, in this case, is that the hyena would have stolen the leopard's kill, and then the leopard followed the hyena as the hyena dragged whatever that kill was away. And that was according to Ephraim's tracking skills. He's 60 years old, I'm told, or plus, I think 62 years old and still driving guests around. He's a little energizer bunny. And why I told you his age is because with it comes a lot of experience. So he's used that experience and tracking skills to work out that the hyena was the one dragging the kill and the leopard was following. I'm guessing it could be Karula. He said it was a female leopard and judging by the area that it was in, it's in the heart of her territory. She was unfortunate to have lost a meal last night. What will often happen is even if the hyena aren't very close to where the kill is made, they will often hear the other animals' alarm calling and therefore run in to investigate. Or it could have just been trailing Karula, knowing that if they're patient enough, the leopard will make a kill at some point, and then they can just snipe in and steal it. Imagine how frustrating that must be for a leopard. But we're gonna swing through that area now and who knows what we will find. Hi, Gabby. You are wondering in areas where there are lots of big trees, would you need to be keeping an eye out for the possible chance of a predator being in one of them? Yes, certainly. Um, not just tall trees, specifically comfortable trees will be the trees that leopards will primarily climb up. They're the only predator that, well, mammalian predator that we'll typically see up in the trees. The cats and uh, the lions and hyenas aren't climbers, nor the cheetahs in this area. So usually, yes, leopard could climb up trees, but specifically the marula trees, which have got large horizontal branches, which are comfortable to laze in, laze around in. So yes, it definitely is worth keeping an eye out in the trees. But I don't think uh, you need to worry in terms of threats. I think if you drove underneath the leopard, it's not going to pounce on the vehicle, thankfully. But definitely you don't want to miss spotting one up in the tree. And a little scan up in the trees, not only for those predators, but also avian predators, owls and eagles. There's lots of birds of prey, or just birds in general that you can spot up in the trees. So I try and scan around in all the likely spots as we move through the area. Termite mounds, marula trees, on the ground, under shady bushes. You'll try and spread the load of where you're looking, I guess. Try and increase your chances of finding something interesting.
Kristen, you'd like to know vultures can see trees. There's the drag mark here. Awesome. So, we have caught up to Ephraim's drag mark. I'm going to try and see if I can find any tracks to show you what's going on. You can clearly... Sorry, Kristen, you'd like to know... Let me just finish your question quickly. Whether vultures can see kills uh, in very thick trees or in thick areas. No, it, it becomes very difficult for them to spot kills, and that's why clever animals uh, will drag their kills underneath the tree, or in Lepa's case, just up into the tree, making it very, very difficult for the vultures to spot them. So this is the drag mark. You can see this long line being dragged. This road is quite hard, so difficult to see the hyena tracks on either side of the drag mark. I can see where a dove has walked across this track, so that indicates to me that it's not incredibly fresh. It means that sometime during the daylight hours when doves are active, the dove would have crossed here. So that helps us to realize that this didn't happen five minutes ago. Can you link to James? OK, we're going to send you to James. Toodle-doo. Gymnogene or African Harrier Hawk. Now, what that Gymnogene or African Harrier Hawk is doing is what he was best designed to do, and that is to climb about on a dead tree like that, which has natural tree cavities in it, or just fly away. Beastly bird. Slow flyer, you can see. OK, now what he's doing, he's, he's going from dead tree to dead tree, looking for tree holes, natural cavities, in which... Ooh, look, look at this. There's a drongo and a hornbill coming to get him. But, and he'll be looking for chicks, nestlings, inside these tree cavities, which he can tear out with his double-jointed intertarsus. It's a fancy way of saying an ankle joint that bends both ways. It's so cool. Excuse me. Oops. Your breakfast time, Brian. Mm -hmm. And that drongo would have flopped across here just to try and see, make sure that he had no nefarious intentions, which of course he de definitely does have. And I think it was no coincidence there's a hornbill sitting in the tree next to him, just watching. And a hornbill, of course, is a tree nesting bird, so. Were there to be a nest of a hornbill around here, I think that hornbill would be going crazy. Hmm. That's a really cool sighting of them. They often don't sit for quite this long. They'll normally just fly off. Hmm. I'm just sure that's kind of slow flight. They can fly it. I mean, they can soar to great heights, of course just like all the other big birds out here. But you saw very wide wing, wide and long wing. There we go. Where's he going? And that wide and long wing makes it very difficult to fly in conditions like this. If they don't have a thermal to soar on, it's inefficient for them to fly, but they can take off quickly. Great sighting of an African Harrier Hawk, a.k.a. Gymnogene. Well done, Brian. Thank you, James. Yes, good job. We are on Leadwood Road. We've been past the Leadwood, where there was a squirrel or two. And now we are heading towards Drakensberg Road with its view unsurprisingly, of the Drakensberg. Fortunately, no further sign of lion or leopard, or indeed wild dog, which I had sort of hoped for after my spotting this morning. Perhaps this afternoon will yield better results. Amazing to me where 
where the elephants have gone. I cannot imagine where they have departed to, what fairer climbs they could possibly have found. But they might, you know, they may well sort of make internal local migrations. And certainly, I mean, this area even, compared with the area around Treehouse Dam, is much grayer and browner. We obviously didn't get as much rain as the area around Treehouse Dam. It's only two kilometers away. So I think you'll probably find that that last rain that we had was, although we had 20 mils around the DRC area, probably find that there are areas of the Sabi sands that had up to 60 millimeters and maybe the grass is in better shape there and the elephants have headed across to those sorts of areas. Anna Marie, you want to know if we have a harvest season in South Africa like you do in autumn in the US? Well, yes, normally. Not really this year though. So all the maize and wheat farmers and all the other kind of agriculturalists would normally be about to harvest now. And that is not going to happen this year. The entire farming belt of South Africa has been devastated by this drought. So yes, in ordinary years, Anna Marie, we would certainly have a harvest season. Not so much this year. Very nice question there. That said, there are areas of South Africa where you can grow things full time. Of course, if you're in the US, or certainly large portions of the US and um, Europe, you'll have one crop, you'll harvest it in autumn, and then the fields will lie fallow for the winter time because you can't grow anything in them because it's too cold. And here, it's not so much cold that is a limiting factor, although on the high field where the, where the wheat and maize farms are, it is too cold to grow sort of two seasons. Here, it's water. And in the low field, I mean, you can, grow, you can grow crops all year round if you have sufficient water. And I know around where I used to live up near Palabora, there was a farmer who would plant tomatoes and um, pumpkins, what else do you grow, butternuts, um, aubergine, not aubergines, zucchinis, he plant them all year round. And they grow very happily in the winter time. It's a little water bucket. Christine, you say, if the jackalberry tree is eaten by the jackal, what eats the snotberry bush? Um, Christine, that is an apocryphal answer, at least question. I cannot answer it, I don't know. Look at that little donkey-like youngster. Very sweet. Christine, I don't even know why the snotberry bush is called the snotberry bush. I'm going to assume because it's got a very slimy inner fruit. Maybe James Richard can tell us. I've only ever seen, like I say, one or two, and I've never seen them actually um, fruiting. Can you feel the peace that has descended after the expectation of the dawn? a few birds calling, gentle breeze, and building heat. And of course, if you ever hear the tin spot batters going, you know that you've reached that point of the day. On we go, Brian. Time for breakfast. Let's go home. Have a breakfast today, Brian. I think it's a fry up today. All the eggies, think, all the bacon. All the eggies and all the bacon, yes. I think it is a fry up today, Brian. I think we are in luck. So every day we have a different kind of breakfast. Um, one day we'll have a fry up, bacon and eggs, sometimes some tomato and mushrooms. And then uh, the other day we will have muffins. I say we, some. There are some uh, fairly strange dietary tastes within the camp. So we're 
when it's fry up day, there's always a sort of mad rush to head for home and make sure you get your portion of delicious smoky bacon, crispy, and of course the salty if Salty Frank is cooking. Gene makes 76, and maybe Charlie, this Batelier is number 77. Brian, back. Uh, what? Back, back. It's a beautiful adult Batelier there in the tree. Stunning. Now, somebody asked for an adult Batelier today. There you are. Beautiful red face, red feet, black torso, and white and black wings with a brown mantle on the back of the neck. And he's about to take to the air, as I imagine, as the heat builds and the thermals start to come up off the ground. So there we go. Shallow wing beats. I love watching those things fly. I think they're just magnificent. <laughs> cool. Well done, Brian. Thank you for that. Oh, I've managed to pull myself out again. I just don't know how this happens consistently all day long. There we go. Back in. Kirsten, I don't do it on purpose. Kirsten's shouting at me now. I'm going to eat all her bacon before she can get back. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for the drive today. Uh, we're going to hand you back over to Scott. Big thank you to Brian and Thumb. Well done, Thumb. Good job. Semi thank you to Kirsten. Big thank you to Louise. And, of course, to all of you for your comments and questions on these quiet drives. You really do make them highly enjoyable. So thank you very much. And we'll head across to Scott for the final few minutes. Bye-bye. Well, it's not just James who's thinking about bacon. Viem and I have been discussing the exact same thing. We are very, very excited for our fried breakfast. Mm -mm. Very good. I wonder what Salty Frank has done regarding the eggs this morning. Sometimes he makes like this egg muffin kind of thing, really nice. Sometimes it's just the scrambled egg. And sometimes it is the fried version. Only time will tell. Ooh, Barbara, are you suggesting to add a little bit of onion and avocado? Very nice. I'm not sure if we've got any avo. We're getting our resupply today. Um, so things are looking quite bleak regarding ingredients. At the end of the week, we get resupplied every once a week. But uh, Salty Frank usually does do an onion and mushroom combo. So I'm sure that will be there. Mm -mm. Well, I wish you guys could join us for breakfast, but sadly you can't, but you will be able to join us on the Sunset Safari. And looking forward to that already. Oh, there's a racket stick in here making a racket. Let's see if we can't get you a glimpse of it. Oh, there it is. Gotcha. How oh, cool. We should get another view of it. It's almost still close by there, Vin. Um, behind the on the bushes, sadly, when we go forward a bit. Oh, no, it's off. Well, at least you got to have a glimpse of that little rattling cysticula. Tiny bird making a serious racket. Who knows what it's in? Maybe a snake, but they, they've got hair triggers. They alarm at just about anything. It could be us. Not a good indicator to rely on all the time. 
Thank you so much, guys. We look forward to, like I say, the action that will be unfolding a little bit later on on the Sunset Safari. Well done, Viam, on camera. Well done to Kirstu, direct of the show, and to Louise, who is lending her a hand. And, of course, to you for all of your contributions and questions. We shall reconvene this afternoon. Make sure you don't miss out. I've got a feeling that big Birmingham is going to sing for us. See you there.